We generally perform each set to a point at which we can no longer lift the load, or at least quite close to it. This is generally what is considered the point of failure. However, there are some strategies which allow us to continue lifting beyond this traditional point of failure. But are these beneficial for muscle growth? And if so, how can it be implemented in practice? First, let's start by defining what exactly failure is. For this video, we will define failure as the inability to concentrically complete a full repetition despite maximal intent. So there are three key criteria that must be met that constitute what training to failure is. First is that we must literally fail the rep. It doesn't mean stopping before you think you can't lift anymore, it means failing a rep midway through. For example, training to failure on a squat or bench press means you would get pinned under the bar, unless you have a spotter or spotter arm set up. Second is that this must occur despite maximal intent. Again, you cannot decide when you've hit failure, true failure is when muscular fatigue is the limiter of the set. And third is that you cannot complete a full rep. This last point is up to the individual as to what is considered a full rep. So some people's definition of failure might differ from others in this category. In most cases, a full repetition would be defined as full range of motion with no deviations in technique. However, some lifters might allow additional partial reps to be completed or for momentum to be used to continue lifting. And this is also where post-failure training comes into question. So what is post-failure training and is it effective for muscle growth? Well, there isn't really a true thing as post-failure training, it is just that the definition of failure changes. There are a few different ways that we can train beyond the point of the traditional definition of failure. Training methods such as partial reps, drop sets, assisted reps, rest pause, etc. can allow us to continue performing reps after we have reached failure, based on the standard definition. For example, let's take the seated cable row. The initial range of motion, when the arms are extended in front of our body, is the easiest part of the exercise, while the end range, when the arms are closest to our body, is the hardest part. So if we were to train to failure with full range of motion technique and strict form, we could probably get a few more reps by performing some partial reps in the first two thirds of the range of motion. As another example, let's take any bicep curl variation. Let's say we took a set to true failure with any given load. Even after hitting this point of failure, we could continue to perform more reps if we immediately drop the load to the next weight down. And these drop sets could be continued for multiple sets successively. So what we want to know is if these methods of post-failure training are beneficial for muscle growth. The first place to start with this question is looking at the relationship between proximity to failure and muscle growth. The best evidence we have on this topic is this meta-regression which attempted to establish the relationship between proximity to failure and muscle growth. This graph shows the overall theoretical relationship. As we can see, robust hypertrophy can be achieved training quite far from failure, as much as 10 reps in reserve. However, as we get closer to failure, there appears to be a somewhat exponential benefit. So the last few reps of the set appear to be disproportionately more hypertrophic compared with the earlier reps in a set. So it seems that training close to failure is effective for muscle growth. And based on this evidence, it is likely that post-failure training will probably have some additional benefit as it allows us to perform more reps in a highly fatigued state, similar to the last few reps of a traditional set. Furthermore, we also have direct evidence on many of these post-failure training methods. Let's now look at the effectiveness of some post-failure training methods on muscle growth. First, let's look at the effects of drop sets on muscle growth. The best evidence we have on this topic is this meta-analysis. Five studies which compared the effects of drop sets versus traditional training were included in this analysis. This graph shows the effects of drop sets, shown in the blue, versus traditional training, shown in the orange, from each of the five studies. And none of these differences were considered statistically significant. The overall effect of drop sets was considered similar compared with traditional training, and even showed a slight trend in favour of drop sets. So it seems that drop set training is certainly effective for muscle growth, even if lighter loads are used. Another area of research we can look into is partial reps. This refers to continuing a set after you have reached failure with full range of motion by performing a few extra partial range of motion reps. And in some cases, this is likely to enhance the hypertrophic stimulus. This can be speculated by this meta-analysis which compared the effects of partial versus full range of motion training on muscle growth. 
Overall, it was found that full range of motion training was superior to partial range of motion for muscle growth. This can be seen with this point being towards the right side of the midline, indicating a small benefit for full range of motion. Furthermore, in this subgroup analysis, it was found that partial range of motion training in the shortened range was inferior compared to full range, as expected. However, partial reps performed in the lengthened range were found to be superior compared with full range of motion. So in terms of extending a set by performing extra partial reps, this is likely to be superior for hypertrophy, especially if they are performed in the lengthened position. We will discuss how this can be implemented in practice later in this video. Another area of research we can explore is pre-fatigue training. Pre-fatigue is a training method where a muscle group is trained, usually in isolation, before performing a subsequent exercise, usually a compound lift, which involves that fatigued muscle. While this isn't really a post-failure training method, it provides some indirect evidence that we can make inferences from. The small body of evidence we currently have on pre-fatigue shows that it seems to be an effective training strategy. For example, this study explored the effects of pre-fatigue training on quadriceps hypertrophy. 24 untrained men performed three sets of leg press training to failure with 75% 1RM two times per week for nine weeks. One group performed the leg press only, while the other group performed a set of leg extensions to failure with 20% 1RM immediately before the leg press training protocol. As expected, average total leg press training volume was greater in the traditional training group, shown in the blue, compared with the pre-fatigue group, shown in the orange. However, both groups saw similar increases in muscle thickness of all quad muscles measured. So what this study suggests is that even when under highly fatigued conditions, training a muscle to or very close to failure can still induce a great hypertrophic stimulus. This relates back to post-failure training, suggesting that the reps performed in a fatigue state are still going to be effective for hypertrophy despite lifting performance being inhibited. This provides more support in favour that post-failure training can be highly hypertrophic. This evidence all provides some support for the effective reps model. This refers to the idea that the reps towards the end of a set are more hypertrophic compared with the reps at the beginning of a set. And this appears to be somewhat true when we look at the evidence we have discussed so far. However, it should be noted that the reps earlier in a set are not completely useless. They still seem to contribute to muscle growth to some extent. Nevertheless, the idea of post-failure training seems to capitalize on these quote-unquote effective reps. It allows us to accumulate more effective reps without having to perform an additional set from the very first rep. So that brings us to the practical side of things. Should we implement post-failure training? And if so, how can it be used to improve the hypertrophic stimulus? Well, there are a few different practical strategies that can be used in practice. The first and simplest is using lengthened partials. This refers to performing partial range of motion in the range where the muscle is in the longest length. As we discussed, training in the lengthened range appears to be the most hypertrophic portion of the movement. We can use lengthened partials to extend a set once we have reached failure using a full range of motion. And by doing so, we are probably accumulating more effective reps in the most effective range. However, this is more or less applicable based on the specific exercise. For example, additional partials are likely to be less effective for a bench press. This is because the hardest part of the set is already in the lengthened position, the bottom range. So once we get close to failure, the only way to continue the set with partials is to perform the short position, the top half. And as we know, this is probably the least hypertrophic part of the exercise. And also, if we hit failure in the lengthened position, this means we will get pinned under the bar, so we don't even have the option to perform extra partials. However, this is probably going to be a better strategy for an exercise like a lat pulldown, for example. Once failure is reached with full range of motion, we will no longer be able to perform the shortened position, in other words, touching the bar to our chest. However, we can still continue to perform the lengthened portion of the movement, which is probably the most hypertrophic part of the exercise. So in this case, we are probably improving the stimulus of each set. Another strategy is to implement drop sets. There are two practical ways to implement drop sets that I think are useful. First is to add one to two drop sets to the last set of an exercise. Once you have completed the last rep of a set, you can simply drop the load and extend the set one to two more times. This will allow you to accumulate more reps in a highly fatigued state, which essentially replicates the last few reps of a traditional set. 
And second is to replace traditional training with drop sets. So instead of performing three to four traditional sets with one to two minutes rest, you could simply perform three to four consecutive drop sets with minimal rest between each set. This probably isn't going to result in superior muscle growth, but it can achieve similar muscle growth in a shorter duration, if implemented correctly. So it is more of a strategy to make your training more time efficient rather than making it more effective. Furthermore, it can be a strategy to minimize joint stress if you are dealing with joint or connective tissue pain, since it allows you to use lighter loads compared with traditional training. However, it should be noted that drop sets are generally more appropriate for machines or isolation lifts and less appropriate for free weight compound lifts. And another strategy to implement post failure training is the use of myo reps. Myo reps are performed by using one activation set where you would perform a standard set of eight to 12 reps or so taken to or close to failure. Then after a short 10 to 30 second rest period or so, you would perform an additional mini set of around three to six reps with the same load. These mini sets can be performed multiple consecutive times depending on how you want to implement this strategy. So essentially, you are skipping the first half of the set and only performing the last few reps, which could be considered the effective reps. Myo reps can be performed in the same ways that drop sets can be implemented. First is by performing an additional one to two mini sets after the last set of an exercise. This will usually provide a superior hypertrophic stimulus. And second is by replacing traditional training with myo reps. Again, this isn't necessarily going to enhance the hypertrophic stimulus, but it can make your training more time efficient. And the last practical strategy we will discuss is what we will call cheat reps. This refers to using some momentum to lift the weight concentrically, but being strict with the eccentric or lowering phase. Once we reach concentric failure, we can usually continue to perform a few more eccentric reps under control, which may slightly enhance the hypertrophic stimulus of each set. This is possible since we are stronger eccentrically than we are concentrically. In other words, even if we have reached complete failure lifting the load, we are still able to produce higher forces lowering the load. However, this strategy only works effectively for a limited number of exercises. It will only work with exercises that you have the ability to safely generate enough momentum to continue lifting the load concentrically. So this could work for exercises such as bicep curls and lat pulldown variations as an example. Although it wouldn't work for dumbbell press variations or most machines with a fixed movement pattern. So although post failure training might be able to enhance the hypertrophic stimulus to a small extent, we also need to consider its influence on joint stress. Excessive stress can result in the development of pain or irritation of the joint or connective tissue. While we don't have direct evidence looking at the effects of post failure training on injury rates, most lifters would agree that lifting heavier loads, less strict technique, and training with excessive volumes will usually increase our risk of joint irritation. And some of these post failure training methods might increase joint stress to some extent. Techniques such as drop sets and myo reps probably won't significantly influence our likelihood of joint pain as they don't increase load or require technique deviations. And in the case of drop sets, load is actually reduced, which might alleviate joint stress if they are used to replace traditional training. However, techniques such as lengthened partials and cheat reps can sometimes allow you to use heavier loads and introduce deviations in technique. For these reasons, they might increase the overall stress placed on the relevant joints and connective tissue. So if you want to start implementing some of these strategies, I would recommend a gradual introduction. And if you notice any joint or connective tissue pain or irritation, it might be worth ceasing some of these techniques for a short duration, allowing your tissues to adapt to the new stress. So as a summary, let's establish some practical recommendations. Overall, it seems that post failure training methods are likely to be very effective methods of building muscle. Post failure training takes advantage of the effective reps concept. They allow more reps to be performed under local muscle fatigue, which are likely to be slightly superior for hypertrophy compared with the reps performed earlier in the set. Some useful post failure training strategies to implement include additional partial reps performed in the lengthened position, drop sets, myo reps, and cheat reps. These strategies can be implemented to either get more out of a single set or to replace traditional training for a more time efficient training session. However, we should just be aware that some post failure training techniques might increase joint stress. 
so trainees should make sure to gradually introduce new training methods and adjust your training if they are contributing to joint pain or irritation. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Check out flowhighperformance.com for online coaching, training templates, ebooks and more.